Hello there, welcome back to RT International. Ukraine's cash-strapped army is to receive some $300 million in military assistance from America following the approval of Congress. And while the money is still to appear, American soldiers are on the ground training Kiev's troops. But as Murad Gaziev, he reports, frustration is already mounting with Ukrainian army's capabilities. When the civil war began, the Ukrainian military was in a sorry state. It lacked almost everything from organization and morale to basic weapons and even clothes. But since then, it's come a long way in some areas. In other areas, not so much. By and large, the Ukrainian military is a conscript army. And when you hand multi-million dollar weapons to barely trained teenagers, you get trouble. Trouble multiplied by sorely lacking discipline. But not to worry, Washington sent almost 300 of its troops to train Ukraine's fledgling forces. While en route to Ukraine, understood that they might not know even the basics. And when the troops do know how to use something, it's not a fact that that something will work. Abort. Lacking in equipment and spare parts, Ukrainian soldiers have turned creative. Some of their vehicles, for example, would not look amiss on the set of a Mad Max movie. Some might even stand out. But what do ordinary Ukrainians think of the military? The other demon is alcohol. Blame a lack of discipline or stress. Fondness for drinking in the ranks has led to tragic consequences. In this video, locals curse a reportedly drunk Ukrainian soldier who ran over and killed a little girl. The Ukrainian military is being called on to wage the most unpleasant kind of war, a war against its own people. And here you can debate about how much restraint it should have or should have not have shown. But what you can't argue with really is that it's done a messy job so far. Murad Gazdiev, RT, Eastern Ukraine. With the conflict having brought widespread suffering to eastern Ukraine, peace efforts are now the main focus. U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland, she confirmed that ambition. Our main message here uh, was that the United States is prepared now and actively engaged in deepening our engagement, deepening our support for seeing Minsk fully implemented in all of its aspects. The statement followed a two-day visit of the diplomat to Ukraine, where she held talks with the president, Poroshenko. Victoria Nuland is now in Moscow, and she's set to meet with Russian officials on the Ukrainian crisis. Well, we spoke to Jan Aberg, who extensively researched the matter, and he believes that Washington's desire now to aid the Minsk peace accord comes way too late and is a sign of failures in its foreign policy. I personally think it's better to have the Minsk agreement as it was among the parties it was made among. It's a little late for the Americans to come in and say we, uh, we want to be you know, heavily engaged in something they did not produce. The Americans are finding out that they went a little bit too far with you know, um, 
uh, the, the regime change thing and all that that they were instigating, including what uh, Madame Newland was actually personally involved in doing when the whole thing broke loose. The rhetoric is changing and uh, probably, I mean, if you go far in interpreting this, this is a kind of acknowledgement that they are seeing that this is going to hell if they continue with this confrontational, arrogant, expansive policy and they need something that sounds better and more soft. In Macedonia, tens of thousands took part in an anti-government protest on Sunday. The massive rally captured here by a drone was uh, held in the capital of Skopje, with protesters demanding the resignation of the Prime Minister. Organisers say they will stay on the streets until their demand is met. RT's Lizzie Phelan, she went to the government headquarters where the demonstrators are now camped. There's a row of tents here ready for people to stay the night. There's a very festival-like atmosphere, people drinking, there's been music playing. And I have here with me one of the activists from one of the key organisations involved in this protest movement. His name is Vladimir Milchin from the Open Society Foundation, George Soros' foundation uh, for Macedonia. The foundation is doing what others don't do, what government does not do. Basically, keeping the focus on the position and situation and abuse of those who are minorities. George Soros' uh, money, if you like, has spread across the world in terms of uh, supporting so-called revolutions. Yeah. Uh, for example, most recently in Ukraine. Do you see any parallels between what's, what happened in Ukraine and what's happening today in Macedonia? Well, this is not a revolution. This is a peaceful protest. And I hope that uh, it will not end as in Ukraine. Now, this protest today has remained peaceful, but there will be a pro-government rally in Skopje, which has the potential to collide with these protesters here, who say that they're not going to leave until the prime minister resigns. Lizzie Phelan for RT. Islamic State militants have gained full control of the key Iraqi city of Ramandi, forcing government troops there to withdraw. The terror group claims it seized tanks and killed dozens of security officers. Ramadi was one of the few cities in the western Anbar province that was still under government control. While well, Iraqi officials vowed to free the province from the militants after US-led forces retook the city of Tikrit last month. In other world news then. Clashes broke out in the German city of Stuttgart, where thousands turned out to try and stop a gathering of the far-right Pegida movement. Riot officers had to step in to escort Pegida members to their venue after smoke bombs, eggs and apples were thrown at them by rival protesters. The far-right group campaigns against what it calls the Islamization of the West. Well, there's no place like home, they say, but that's if you can afford one, of course. And that's something which is increasingly out of reach in Britain's capital. The average home in London costs a little over £360,000 at the moment. But according to the forecasting body Oxford Economics, by the year 2030, the figure is likely to reach an astonishing £1 million. Well, that's roughly £1.5 million. US dollars. Already, Londoners are having to get creative to get a roof over their heads, as Anastasia Cherkin, as she's been finding out. A housing crisis so widespread, it's pushing people literally into the water. As rents increase and owning your own bricks and mortar is but a dream for many, a growing number of Londoners are turning to boats as a place to call home. In spots like this one, Hackney in East London, the number of boats has gone up by a staggering 85% in the past year alone. It is an overspill from the housing crisis. I can't see any way that I could ever own a house or own an apartment so I could be stable and have a roof above my head and not be worried about bills. 36-year-old teacher Ronan Murphy lives on a boat he bought for £5,000. That's three months' rent for a one-bedroom apartment in the same neighbourhood where he's now docked. I would love if David Cameron and the Tory majority <laughs> can like invested hugely in social housing, that would help, but my belief is they won't. Like most boaters in London, Ronan is a continual cruiser. This is the cheapest way to live on the water, which means relocating every two weeks. There's one marina um, in Southwark which has a waiting list of 400 boats to get in. Um, so I can't see it slowing down anytime soon. Uh, there's 
a lot more people that want to live on boats than have space available. Houseboat broker Angus Rose says the trend of too many people on the water is directly linked to London's housing crisis and buying a boat is much cheaper. You could probably pick one up for about £15,000 um, if you're looking for something with a residential mooring. It's more like £30,000. To get a one-bed apartment, you're looking at more like £250,000. The UK's Canal and River Trust, which looks after the waterway, says there's overcrowding on the water, but they too acknowledge that the problem is a lack of affordable housing on land. You can't count out the economic and socio-economic factors that are perhaps pushing people onto the canals as a place to live. I think the canals have become a victim of their own popularity. The organisation is working to make moorings available for those in need of a spot. Somebody has to catch people, you know, I'm sorry. Somebody has to help them out and if the society at large isn't, um, hopefully the Canal and River Trust will. Anastasia Churkina, RT, London. Now, hold on to your seat. High wind at the Madeira Airport in Portugal is testing pilot skill to the maximum. As you can see, the planes are going in almost sideways, then straightening up at the last minute to touch down safely. But the smoothest landings, um, but some didn't even manage that and gave up at the last minute. Some took several attempts, while others failed to land altogether and diverted to less windy airports. But luckily, no injuries or damage has been reported. This me. Right, coming up, it's Sophie Shevardnadze. She talks with a journalist who went undercover with Islamic State.